All right, we're going to, we're really working in chapter 14, Romans 14, but we're going to spring off. Remember, I kind of said Romans 14 and 15 go together like a hand in a glove. Uh, so we're going to spring off that. We're actually going to be in Romans 15, but uh, I just wanted to b- kind of bring back to our thinking, bring back to our minds, uh, what a wonderful portion of scripture we And so often, I have a, a ton of commentaries, and so often they just kind of rush through chapters 14 and 15. Really, they kind of rush through chapters 12 through 16. You know, they lump it under practical truth. Uh, not really, all the important stuff has basically been said before. Uh, now this just those practical things, uh, not as important as what he had earlier. But that we have to uh, not trivialize God's word. What he's saying here in Romans 14 and 15 is the culmination, it's the apex, it's the summit of the book of Romans. He's going to take now everything he's taught us in the first 13 chapters of Romans, and he's going to say, now you Romans, and remember, since this is uh, an epistle from Paul, it's written specifically to and about us, uh, so what we can't do when we're using the Old Testament, put us in the place of Israel or uh, the Old Testament prophets or that kind of thing, we can do with Paul uh, because it's written to us. So when he is instructing the Romans, he's instructing us. And he's telling them, now that you have this epistle to Rome, now that you have this foundation of all uh, true Christianity, now that you know the bulk of what God's doing today, here's the million dollar question. It's a question we all have to face. Are we or aren't we going to operate according to his word? It's a simple choice. Most of histor- historic Christianity has decided not to operate according to that. And they've gone off their own way, and they operate according to religious systems, uh, man-made religious systems, man-centered theological systems. They've thrown away Paul's distinct apostleship, and they just go about their own way. But God and Paul want us to come here now to Romans 14 and 15, and he's going to challenge the Romans. He said, now fix the problems in your assembly, and there's a big one. You get to Romans 14, and there's a big division starting to happen in Rome. You have those of the weak in the faith, probably those with a strong Jewish background. They're going to Moses, and they read God's word through Moses, and he, they read uh, God's word says through Moses that there's a whole bunch of unclean things. Uh, don't eat any of them, and if you do, you're going to sacrifice your position before God, your status before God. Paul comes along, and God says through Paul, there's nothing unclean, eat whatever you want, and it has no effect on your status before God. It's a wonderful example because you can't put the two together. It's impossible. So what are you going to do? Well, what is historic Christianity? Well, it's on Mondays and Wednesdays and Fridays, I'll follow Moses. On Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, I'll follow Paul. I'll do what I want to do. Sometimes I'll do that. Sometimes I'll mix them all together. And it's just confusion. It's just uh, foolishness. And so when we get here to Romans 14 and 15, uh, I've been saying this really since chapter 12, uh, when he's giving this information, he's throwing down the gauntlet. You have to make a choice now. Paul's been here, not in person, but through this epistle. And he's throwing down the gauntlet. Are you or are you not now going to operate according to God and his word and what he says he's doing today? It's a simple uh, choice, and we all have to make it. We have to make it as an assembly, as individuals and as an assembly. This is the pinnacle of everything uh, Paul's been saying. Uh, And so we're going to look now, and we kind of divided this up, uh, the problem that's in Rome. And it's the same problem uh, of historic Christianity for the last 2,000 years. Uh, If there's a problem in any assembly, anywhere, anywhere in the body of Christ, it's because of this. The issue for the Romans isn't that they didn't have faith. Notice uh, they were the weak in the faith, but they still had faith. And there's the strong in the faith, but they still had faith. The issue wasn't whether or not you have faith in God's word. The question is, do you have faith in God's word rightly divided? That was the problem. The weak in the faith, they have the God's word through Moses, they have God's word through Paul, and they don't know how to bring them together. 
and there's a good reason they don't know how to bring them together is you can't bring them together. You can't. You can't observe cl uh, clean and unclean foods when, according to Paul, there are no clean or unclean foods. You can't, to, you can't put the two together. It's a great example, uh, and it pertains to every other aspect. You can carry that into every other uh, problem in the assembly. They're probably confusing something in God's prophetic program with the nation of Israel with something in God's mystery program for the body of Christ. And as soon as you do that, it's just confusion, it's error, it results in division. Uh, I don't need, it, I can say it unquestionably because all, on your car ride here today, how many churches on every street corner did you pass? They're all saying something different. They're all a different organization. There's tens of uh, so-called religious Christian religions. Uh, there's hundreds of denominations, thousands of sects, church on every different street corner. They're all saying something different because they're not necessarily all unbelievers, they all have faith, but do they have faith in God's word rightly divided? And then the second problem is those who do rightly divide their, word, their Bibles, uh, are they operating on the basis of love? That's the problem here in Rome. The problem was that they were operating by faith in God's word, the weak in the faith were operating according to faith in God's word, but it was faith in God's word wrongly divided. And as soon as they did that, it opened up the door to the flesh, gave a foothold, a stronghold to the flesh, and the flesh starts going to work. And there's division, uh, and they're being separated. They're broken out into two groups. They're fighting. They're judging and condemning each other. They're despising uh, and treating each other as nothing, being unwelcoming or just welcoming in like a little trap to argue with someone. It's opening the door. They had faith, but it was in God's word wrongly divided. And then you had that that was the weak in the faith. Then you have the strong in the faith. They're a little further down the road of right division, but they weren't using it in a loving manner. They weren't using it in love. Those are the two problems. Uh, and in the rest of Romans 14, in the first couple of verses of chapter 15, he's going to address the problem of love, the strong, aimed especially at the strong believer, and then where we're actually going to go today, we're going to skip over this because I want to conclude the book of Romans with this section. Uh, we're going to go and look at the right division first uh, and then come back and finish off this love with an explosion uh, of love as we close out. It brings a tear to my eyes. Close out the book of Romans. So let's go ahead and I have a science background, so I put together a kind of a chart, pretty, pretty lame chart. Uh, but hopefully it gets the point across. Here's our two problems we have uh, in, in Rome. One is there's a shortage of right division, and one, there's a shortage of love. So if you look at these axes, you have right division. As you go up, you have increasing uh, right division. Uh, you have increasing, we, can, we, can, we never really reach it, right? We want to keep uh, rightly dividing God's word, uh, learning from God's word rightly divided more and more and more. Uh, and that's like, an, you can think of that as an exodus, axis increasing up. Then you have the love exodus and the horizontal, and that's increasing love. And we'll take a look at that. And now where we fall uh, now for the, in the assembly in Romans 14 is you have the weak in the faith are in that first quadrant in the lower left there. They're in that first quadrant. Uh, they don't have a great development of right division. That's going to be their first problem. And then you have the strong in the faith that have a little full further development, a little increase in right division, but they're not using it in love. Those are the two problems of all historic Christianity. If you took the answers Paul gives in Romans 14 and 15, I'm going to say it boldly, I think I've said it before, it would solve every problem in historic Christianity. And that's what they need to address. So the strong in the faith would be in the left quadrant. They're a little further along on the right division arrow. 
I'm so sure they're not as full as they should be, but they're moving a little bit further down there. They've embraced Paul's distinct apostleship, probably came out of a Gentile background, so it was a little easier for them. You know, all the Gentiles had was a bunch of idols uh, and, not, and the superstitious nonsense. Uh, and he tells the Thessalonians, they turned to God, and then you know what, they just forgot about the idols. The idols were nothing. God didn't have a word through the idol system, idolatry. Uh, but the weak in the faith, they had it a little tougher. They had a strong Jewish background, might have been brought up on the Old Testament, on the sayings of Moses. They may have never in their lives, they might be 60 years old, and have never eaten anything unclean. And they would have said, just like Peter and Paul said, and I'm not going to start now. And they have a little longer road to go because they actually do have a word from God. And so you have these two groups. Now the key that he's going to bring out here is uh, that what the weak in the faith need to do is they need their first problem. They have, they have, you know, there's more than one problems, but the major problem for the weak in the faith is they need to learn how to rightly divide their scriptures. And, th and the strong in the faith who are already at least beginning more and more further along the line of rightly dividing the scriptures, they need to operate more on the basis of love, increase in love. The goal of this whole, uh, of God, what God wants us to be, not just the Romans, but the us here in Rolling Meadows as well, he wants us all in this upper quadrant. He wants us up here increasing right division with increasing love, and he wants this whole group to be put here. The weak in the faith, their major problem is they need to learn to rightly divide their scriptures. And then once they re rightly divide their scriptures, they'll increase in love and be in this quadrant. The strong in the faith, who are already to some degree at least rightly dividing their scriptures, need to grow in love, and they'll be brought over in this quadrant. And when they're in this quadrant, this is where God wants us to be. This is the goal of Christian living. This is the goal of the Christian life, to be in this quadrant. Increasing right division, understanding God's word through uh, right division, uh, and increasing, implementing it, exercising that in love. They go together. By the time you get to Romans 15, they should be one united group, strong in faith and love. This is called spiritual maturity. Notice there's not much in this quadrant. And we'll look at it, let's look at the reason why there's nothing in this quadrant. Uh, let's go over to Philippians. Let's go to Philippians 1. I know I've already promised, uh, if, if everyone uh, wants me to continue, they go on into uh, Ephesians after we're done here with Romans. Uh, I have a tempting, I'm always tempted to go to Philippians because that's actually my favorite book. But I'm not going to go there. But today we're going to go there and just look at verse 9. Well, we'll pick it up at verse 8. Remember the Philippians, they are uh, already participating They've been faithful, I guess is the word I'm looking for, faithful in supporting, uh, advancing, defending, participating in Paul's distinct apostleship. I guess we should uh, look at that up at verse 7. Even it is meet for me to think of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are all partakers of my grace." We've seen that over and over in Romans. I won't run through them all again. Uh, but my grace, you know, we, hopefully everybody, as soon as you hear the word Paul's grace, my grace out of the lips of Paul, uh, what comes into mind is Pauline, grace, mystery, truth. Romans 16, 25. So they are faithful. Uh, they're in this quadrant. Uh, they're doing mo better than most assemblies. They're well in this quadrant. But look how they got to this quadrant and how they're going to stay in this quadrant. And for that, look at verse 8 now. For God is my record, how greatly I long for you all in the bowels, that we, we might say today the heart or the inner person of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound. 
All right, now we got love abounding. Isn't that what we're looking for here uh, in uh, the Roman assembly? They're not uh, the strong in the faith especially, but it's also true of the weak in the faith. Uh, the weak in the faith's major problem is they don't rightly divide. But they have a minor problem too, and that's love. They're judging and condemning others. Uh, the strong in the faith, they're doing a little better in the right division, increasing in right division, but they're not using it out of love. They need to grow in love. Both groups need to grow in love. For the weak in the faith, first they have to increase in right division, and then they can operate, they can increase in love. Now, why does uh, first come right division and love second? Well, we got the answer right here. It's why there's nothing in this quadrant. You can't love in uh, agape love, responding on the basis of the love of God at the cross of Christ uh, without knowledge. Let's look at this. Verse 9, And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge. Uh, and remember there, we looked at that when we were looking at the change, the transition period. During the transition period, Paul referred to his knowledge as gnosis, uh, partial knowledge. Once you get to Philippians and Ephesians and Colossians, the, fine, the later books, it's always epinosis, full knowledge. And here it's epinosis. Uh, in our English, it just has knowledge, but it's actually full knowledge. And here he says they can abound yet more and more. How are you going to abound in love more and more? Now, when I was growing up, I remember he, my pastor uh, at that time, uh, I remember him, he took his fist, he was a big burly guy, and he took his fist and wanged it on his pulpit. Uh, and believe me, that reverberated through the place, and I still remember it to this day. So I guess if that was what he was trying to do, it worked. Uh, and he said that he was so uh, mad at people who were teaching, and I guess this was a big thing in the evangelical uh, realm, and it's probably been codified into law now in the evangelical realm, uh, we don't need doctrine, we just need love. And he slammed his fist down, and that woke everyone up, uh, because you can't have, here's the thing that God says, you can't have love without doctrine. Love flows out of doctrine. And where do you get doctrine from? You get doctrine from the word rightly divided. That's why for the weak in the faith, he doesn't uh, bring them into the love thing right at the beginning. He will later, right at the beginning. For the love thing, he's going to emphasize that, especially for the strong believer, because they're growing in right division already, and they're abounding in love, and that should bring them over to this category. The weak in the faith, their pro major problem is that they're not rightly dividing the scriptures. So they're not operate on the basis of doctrine for today, and that's preventing them from increasing in love. Verse 9, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge, full knowledge. That's When he says full knowledge, he's talking about Pauline grace mystery truth. He's talking about the full knowledge of the full revelation, which is now available in these prison epistles, uh, and with and uh, in all judgment that ye may approve the things that are excellent. Well, we have, there's a famous dispensational book that approve the things that are different, the things that differ, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. So here we have the way it works. Uh, if you want superabounding love, you have to have superabounding knowledge uh, that comes out of doctrine. And you get superabounding knowledge out of rightly dividing God's word. So for the weak in the faith, their primary task is to increase in their right division. For the strong, to get them up into that second quadrant there, once they're in the second quadrant with the strong in the faith, they can together grow in love together and come into this quadrant. And this is where uh, the goal of every believer should be. This is the goal every assembly should be. Right division increases knowledge, which increases love, uh, and love flows out of all of that. 
Uh, and so that's the, the, the kind of the flow that's going to go here. We're going to, we're going to jump together with the weak in the faith now, and we're going to look at this right, the concept of right division. All right, so let's go back to Romans 15. We introduced this last time, so I'm not going to redo last time, but let's at least uh, remember where we were at here. We're going to come back to the love aspect, and we're going to kind of end the epistle on that. Uh, but here we're going to look at this whole right division uh, and how to use God's word. Can you imagine anything more important in the world than how to understand and handle God's word? I can't. And it's a shame that historic Christianity has had God's full and complete word for 2,000 years and they don't know, still don't know what to do with it. Paul tells us here. And yeah, I know, people write to me all the time and sometimes talk to me and they say, this right division is so complicated. I don't, no, it's the, no, what you're believing is complicated. This is simple. Paul's going to explain the, every principle of right division in just 10 or 12 verses here. If you get this, you got the whole thing. You don't need the religious systems. You don't need the theological systems because you got God and Paul. It's the only reason this seems hard and complicated is because we've been taught so much other wrong stuff that when we hear the right thing, we can't even understand it. We think it's complicated because now we've got to unlearn all this other stuff that we thought we knew uh, and replace it with this. This is the easy stuff. So let's go through uh, and see why uh, this is such an important thing as we go through here. So he, in Romans 5, 4 to 20 or so, he's going to give us the basics of how to rightly handle the word of God. It tells us what we need to know if we want to use God's word the way God intends it uh, to do, tends it to be. So let's begin at verse 4. We're just going to read through. We, we made it, I think, uh, through verse 8 last time. So we're going to kind of just scan down them, pick it up, especially at these Old Testament references beginning uh, in verse 8, the end of verse 8, or excuse me, the end of verse 9. So let's look at verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. Okay, well, here you have the basic thing. This is his introduction. He's just told the strong believer, we don't know because remember I skipped over this section, but I think I told you enough about love and the strong believer. By the time you get to the end of chapter 14, he's explained the strong believer need to operate on the basis of love. He tells them how to do it. And now the strong believer, what was the strong believer doing at the beginning of chapter 14? He was despising and uh, and being unwelcoming to the weak in the faith. Well, by the time you get to the end of Romans 14, the end of the chapter, he comes along and now the strong in the faith have their arm around the weak in the faith. And they brought them to them and they're, go they're edifying them, they're bearing, his, they're helping, <clears throat> helping them to bear his burdens. He, they're holding him up, they're edifying him, they're establishing him, and they bring him under the, out of love. And that's where chapter four, or verse four comes in now. And he, he, God's going to tell them, Paul's going to tell them, uh, now teach them how to rightly divide their scriptures. That's the only answer to the problem in Rome. It's the only answer to historic Christianity. And every single problem, every single issue, every single confusion, it's the only answer. But you don't do it out of the flesh, pushing them away, ridiculing them. Uh, you bring them out of love under your arm, and you teach them how to rightly divide the scriptures. And the beginning point here is verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. Well, what was written aforetime uh, most likely is the main reference here in Romans. It would have been the Old Testament, right? Uh, where... Uh, some in the assembly were going to Moses and saying God's word to Moses. It says there's a bunch of unclean things. Don't eat anything unclean uh, or you're going to sacrifice your status before God. Well, why should we stop believing that? Paul comes along and says something the exact opposite. How are you going to deal with that? How are you going to put it together? You're just going to ignore it? You're just going to say odd days of the week I'll do one, even days of the week I'll do the other? I'll pick the ones I feel like doing and not do the ones I don't feel like doing. 
So that's an, and then you're told you're being spiritual operating that way, and you're just, it's just carnal. Whatsoever things afore were written, probably mostly the Old Testament, but uh, at this time, contrary to what a lot of commentators uh, believe and Bible scholars believe, uh, so you don't have to go along with this or not, uh, but I don't think a lot of the things people, the books written uh, that most commentators say were written really late, way late, uh, I think most of them were written much earlier. Uh, that one year in early Acts, the extension of grace and mercy, boy, when things start falling apart, what does Peter and the 12 say? They have to bring in some helpers because they're busy doing the work of, of, the, of the word of God. They're working on the word of God. Now, pastors teach that, and they're like, wow, this is such a great thing because I can get rid of my workload. I'll use this passage to get rid of my workload because i got to prepare for my message on Sunday. So I can't be cleaning tables and doing all this other stuff. I got this other stuff. He, that has absolutely nothing to do about what's going on in Acts. I think in Acts, when the, Peter and the 12 say they're busy working on the word of God, it's not, uh, they're not preparing for Sunday's message. Uh, they're writing God's word. And I personally, you know, most people disagree with this, but you don't have to agree with it, but I think the gospel accounts were written by the end of that first year. Uh, I think certainly James was written, perhaps Hebrews. Uh, and so I think there might have been, and certainly there was Paul's earlier epistles were available. Galatians, 1 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians, very likely they would have had. So you see how this is all coming together. You got the Old Testament, uh, for sure. You got the gospel accounts who were probably being written, if not in written form, uh, then they were verbal. They were passing around verbally, but pro I think probably in written form. You had the general epistles, Peter and the 12 again, and the 12 uh, and the general epistles. You got some of Paul's early epistles. You see what's, imagine someone dumping that all on your lap. It'd be, it's just a hodgepodge of scriptures. Old Testament, the Gospel accounts, the ministry of Peter and the Twelve, the God, some are Paul's early epistles. What do you do with it all? That's the problem in Rome. What do we do with it all? And he's going to tell them what to do with it all. First, he's going to tell them about what to do with the Gospel accounts and the ministry of Peter and the Twelve. Then he's going to tell them what to do with the Old Testament. Then he's going to tell them what to do with Paul's epistles. And when you come out the other end of that, you're going to be way up. If you've been responsive, if you've been receptive, if you've received God's word through Paul, you're going to be on the increasing arrow of right division. And once you're on the increasing arrow of right division, you'll be increasing in knowledge, the full knowledge of what God's doing today. And if you're increasing in the full knowledge of what God's doing today, you're increasing in love, and you're moving at least to this quadrant. So that's the goal here. So what, they got this hodgepodge of scriptures, they got the Old Testament, they, they certainly had verbal accounts of the gospel accounts, if not actually written, they got the ministry of Peter and the Twelve, they got Paul's early epistles, they got all this stuff going around like juggling balls. They're all just up in the air. What do they do with them all? What do we do with them all? Do we just, uh, is God's word just like a, a pagan, a superstitious, a, a religious book? You open to a page, you close your eyes, put your finger on a verse, oh, that's the verse God intended for me today, uh, and use it as a superstitious thing that, or do we come to God's word and do what it says here, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. God wants us to learn something from his word that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. God has something in his word that he wants to teach us. Now, if you don't care about God and his word, if you're not really interested in what he's doing or what he wants to teach us, well, then he, that's, a, that's an option. You can go down that road. But this is for people, and he's given these Romans, we saw that at the beginning of chapter 14 as well, he's giving them the benefit of the doubt that when they hear this through God's word through Paul, they're going to receive it 
in faith operate on the basis of their sonship position, which will open the door to the Lord's persuading work that's going to persuade them of all the ramifications of what God's doing today, beginning well, with the food regulations, the feast days, the other, what to do with the works of the law, the law in general. God, it's a whole prophetic program with the nation of Israel. What do you do with it? And it's going to all be explained here. He wants to teach us that. Now, if you don't want to be taught that, if that's, is, that doesn't interest you, you are, want, are interested in other, well, then you're interested in other things. But this is for people who want to know what God has to say. And if you go to God's word, you've got to use it the way he tells us to use it. And as, when we do that, we'll have patience and comfort in, of the scriptures and, ha and have hope. We come, we see God faithfully working, and whether it be his prophetic program with the nation of Israel or with his mystery program for the body of Christ, when we see God faithfully working, that produces patience and comfort and enhances our hope. Now, the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded, one toward another, according to Christ Jesus. And we won't, I should go back to Philippians 2, but I'm hoping everyone knows those first half of Philippians 2 there where uh, Paul explains the mindedness of Christ, who was, see, I can't stop, I can't stop, who was absolute God, who set aside, uh, didn't exercise his divine prerogatives, his resort for his own benefit, but used them for the benefit of the others, becoming a servant and becoming a man, going to his death, even the death of the cross. That's the like-mindedness. That's love, agape love. And he's praying here, he wants the Romans to have that like-mindedness. Have that like-mindedness. Why, Paul? Why do we need to have that like-mindedness? Verse uh, five. Now the God, or verse six. That that you notice that so that ye may be you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore receive ye one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. So there you got the glory of God all over here. Uh, if you're not interested in the glory of God, then this passage isn't, is just going to be something you throw away, scan over, and dispose of. If you want to participate and know and glorify God, this is the most critical of passages. Extremely critical passage. This explains everything, what to do with everything he's taught in the first 13 chapters. It explains what you're supposed to do with all the rest of his epistles, what you're supposed to do with Peter and the Trolls, what you do with the Gospel account, what you do with the Old Testament. He puts it all together so that God can teach us something. So that, so be, have this like-mindedness of Christ, and it, it comes from God. Notice he's, uh, Paul here, he's praying. He's in the, uh, in the presence of God, and he's praying. And he's brought the Romans into the presence of God with him. We'll see that as we go through here. He's brought them into his prayer life. And you remember, since the Romans are part of God's mystery program for the body of Christ, that means when he brought the Romans in there, he brought the rolling meadowins in there too. We're in there with him. And he's looking at us and he's telling us, learn from God's word. God has something to teach you. And then he looks at God and he looks at God and he says, give them a like-mindedness, the like-mindedness that Christ had. And he says, now why? so that they can with one mind and one mouth, here especially Jew and Gentile together, but you could uh, apply it to any different division within the assembly, uh, Jew and Gentile together could with one mind and one mouth glorify God together. What, they're gonna, what we're all going to be doing, we learned earlier at the judgment seat of Christ, uh, we don't have to wait till we get to heaven. We can begin doing right now, and here's the thing, every moment we spend participating in what God's doing today, worshiping and praising him, one with another, is a moment that goes from time to eternity, uh, goes from the finite to the infinite. 
it's never, unlike everything else we do in this life, we can be doing important things, but unlike anything else we do in this life, uh, it's the only thing of infinite and eternal value. And he wants them to be involved in that. And he says here, so, and they'll be, when they're doing that, when God uh, gives them this like-mindedness, and how is he going to give it to them? It's not be like uh, he decides, I'll give it to Job but not to Sam or whatever. Uh, he's giving this like-mindedness to all. Some receive it and some don't. And Paul's praying that these Romans would receive from God this like-mindedness that will allow them with one mind and one mouth, Jew and Gentile together, to uh, already do what everyone's going to be doing in heaven, to already be uh, proclaiming, worshiping, and praising God with one mind and one mouth, and that's the only thing that's going to make them receive one another the way Christ received them, to the glory of God. And how did Christ receive us? Well, that's the whole point of this passage. Uh, the weak in the faith are suggesting uh, reception before God hinges in some way, at least, on the works of the law, like observing the food regulations. Uh, Paul has already explained our reception by God has been completely by grace. It's been a gracious. And they can participate in that if they learn from God's word. God's going to, well, he prays that God give them a like-mindedness that will allow them to gather to worship and praise God with one mind and one mouth that will bring them together in unity as an assembly to the glory of God. Uh, and what's the beginning point of that? Now we get to the, the critical, th uh, I guess we could break it down to three steps here, uh, the critical application that he's talking about here. Uh, and he's going to bring out now, verse 8, I say that Jesus Christ was, notice it's the past tense, it's not happening now in, in Paul's ministry, he was in the past, the minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the Father. And we covered this verse in some detail last week, so I'm not going to redo that uh, the whole thing there. One thing I do just want to bring out, I don't know if it's real visible or the print is too small to make it fit that chart, but I do want to just bring out, here's the very first thing. If you want to learn from God's word. Now, if you don't want to learn from God's word, you just want to do your own thing and think your own way, well then, or your way, you're theological, you're really, well then you just go that way. But if you want, here's the challenge Paul's given them, if you want to think the way God thinks. Here's the very first thing you need to know when it comes to God and his, God's word. You have this hodgepodge of scriptures. You got the Old Testament, you got the Gospel accounts, you got the ministry of Peter and the Twelve, you got Paul's early epistles, at least at this point. You got all this stuff bubbling around. What do you do with it all? The very first thing is you take the Gospel accounts and the ministry of Peter and the Twelve and put them in their place. And where they reside, verse 9, excuse me, verse 8, uh, is that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God. Uh, and that, of course, Peter and the Twelve is part of his earthly ministry. That Christ came to uh, confirm the promises that God made to the nation of Israel through the prophets since the world began. That's where you take the gospel accounts, Peter and Charles' mystery. It's part of that. It's not part of God's mystery program for the body of Christ. Christ's earthly ministry and the ministry of Peter and the Twelve is confirming the promises. God is going, is committed, and is going to remain faithful to his program for the nation of Israel, his prophetic program for the nation of Israel. He sent Christ and Peter and the Twelve to confirm it show that he's not changed his mind about Israel. He's going to complete their program. And I'm not going to redo what we did last week, but I want to just look at three verses. Uh, and if you want more detail, I did cover this last week. But I just want to go to, uh, to uh, at Luke, the beginning of Luke. And I, this is 
really something worth spending some time on uh, because we have to understand this ourselves. We have to be clear ourse to ourselves. But more important, not more important, but equally important, is it'd be nice if we could explain this to others. And it's not hard. It's simple. The reason, I said this earlier, the re only reason we think this is so hard is because we've been taught so much wrong stuff that when we hear the simple right answer, we don't even recognize it. Here's the simple and right answer of what you do with the gospel accounts and the ministry of Peter and the Twelve as in Acts and those uh, general epistles. And the key, f key phrase here, again, we did this touch the bases last week, so I'm just going to skim the, over the surface. But I think it's important enough to put on one little uh, nugget because this is the way you can share this with other people. I've talked to people, I've sent emails and they explain this, and when you put these three things together, some people still don't get it, but some people get it. It's another tool we can use. This is the basis of God's word, knowing what to do with that hodgepodge of scriptures that were bubbling around in the first century. And the first thing, when it comes to the gospel accounts, Notice in verse, this is Luke 1, verse 67. The only reason I really want to go there is I want to show you, this is Zacharias, Zacharias, John the Baptist's father, but it's not really Zacharias talking. Look what it says in verse 67. And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. This isn't really Zacharias talking. This is God, the Holy Spirit, talking. And he says, I'm not going to go through the whole passage again. We did that last week, but look at verse 70. And he, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. And if you read the whole passage, you'll see what Zacharias, what God the Holy Spirit is explaining there is that Christ's earthly ministry was to confirm the promises made to the fathers of Israel. What the prophets had spoken about, listen to this phrase, get this phrase in your head. It's a pretty short phrase, so I know we can all do it. If it can stay in my head, it can stay in all of your heads. What the prophets had spoken about since the world began. The Old Testament, the gospel, the, the, well, I put it a different way. The gospel accounts are not uh, a new thing. Uh, some of historic Christianity says God, the ch God began the new thing, the church, the body of Christ, and the gospel. God and the, the Holy Spirit says, no, he's continuing an old thing. He's continuing what the prophets have been speaking about since the world began in the Old Testament. That's what's going on in the gospel accounts. Now go to Acts, because here uh, you have a large section. I'm just talking about believing Christianity, of course, Apostate Christianity just messes up everything, too. Uh, but believing Christianity, a large section, thinks that God began something new in the gospel accounts. Well, we just saw that can't be true. God, the Holy Spirit, says he's continuing something old. He doesn't begin something new there. He's fulfilling, confirming and fulfilling his prophetic problem with the nation of Israel, the promises to the fathers. Now you get another section, a big, pretty big section of uh, believing Christianity. We'll call it Acts 2 dispensationalists, whether you go towards the Pentecostal angle or more the Pauline angle, uh, you still end up in that Acts 2 position. They say that God began the church, something new, his new mystery program, uh, and the church at Pentecost with Peter and the Twelve. But look, what, remember what's, what the Holy Spirit said at the Christ's earthly ministry? This is what had been spoken about by the prophets since the world began. Now, some say God began something new in the ministry of Peter and the Twelve of Pentecost. But look what the Holy Spirit says about Peter and the Twelve's ministry. Acts 2, Acts 3. Acts 3, verse 21. Whom the heaven must receive... Uh, and to remember, this is Acts 2, so death, resurrection, ascension of Christ, Peter's preaching here. 
uh, these sermons at Pentecost and around that day of Pentecost, uh, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So now you can answer. It's the simplest thing in the world. Did God begin? Does God say he began something new in Acts? In, at Pentecost, anyway, in the ministry of Peter and the Twelve? Absolutely not. It's continuing something old. The gospel accounts are what Christ, what God had been speaking about since the world began. The ministry of Peter and the Twelfth was confirming the promises to the Father. Let's just read a little more. Verse 22. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, there we have our fathers, uh, and it's not the church fathers, it's the fathers of Israel. A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you and your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which hear not the prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Uh, so the enemies are going to be destroyed. That's what Peter is preaching on Pentecost. Uh, is that what Paul preached? What's Paul preach? Today, God's saving his enemies. Verse 24. Yea, and all the prophets from Sam, here we have basically the same statement from prophet that, uh, and those that follow after so many have spoken have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and the covenant which God made with your father, saying unto Abraham, and in, these, in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. And how are all the kindreds, this is where we get, this is the hedge point into the next sect verse in chapter 15 of Romans. How do all the, the whole world of Gentiles get blessed in God's prophetic program with the nation of Israel, which had been spoken about since the world began, recorded in the ministry of Peter and the Twelve, the Gospel accounts in the Old Testament? How are the Gentiles blessed? Well, it says they're blessed in accord with the Abrahamic covenant. Well, okay, how did the Abrahamic covenant bless the Gentiles? Remember uh, Genesis 12, one, uh, 2, I guess it is. Uh, I will bless those that bless you and curse those who curse you. That's how the Gentiles get blessed in God's prophetic program with the nation of Israel. First, Israel, and look what it, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself because he says all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. Look at verse 26. How is he blessed the nations, the jet? the Gentiles, all the kindreds of the earth in his prophetic program for Israel. How does he bless the Gentiles today? Keep this contrast in mind. We're going to, this is all going to come up in Romans 15. Unto you, that's Israel, he's talking to ye men of Israel, the leaders of Israel, unto you first, God, having raised up his son, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. The Abrahamic covenant works by Israel first being blessed, Israel first being shown mercy, Israel first being saved. And then with Israel and through her rise, God's mercy, salvation, and blessing go out to the rest of the world. And the only ones left it goes out to uh, because it says the enemies are destroyed. They're going to take that out to the friendly Gentile nations. Not at all what God's doing today. So we have two. We have the gospel accounts. We have the ministry of Peter and the Twelve. And God explains that they're both are in line with what the prophets had spoken about. Remember this phrase. Keep this one because we're going to, this is an important one. Uh, what the prophets had spoken about since the world began. Now go to Romans 16, 25. How does the Holy Spirit describe Paul's ministry? We found out how he described the gospel accounts, Christ's earthly ministry, how he described the uh, ministry of Peter and the Twelve as something the prophets had spoken about since the world began. Look at verse 25, Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel, Paul's gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery. Now, you still have the phrase that the Holy Spirit used for Peter and the Twelve and Christ's earthly ministry in your mind, what the prophets had spoken about since the world began. Look how he describes Paul's apostleship, Paul's ministry. And it says, which was kept secret 
since the world began. That's the basis of right division, handling God's word rightly. Everything outside of Paul's epistles have to do with God's prophetic program for the nation of Israel, which he had spoken about since the world began. Paul's epistles, Paul's ministry, Paul's apostleship has to do with things that God kept secret since the world began. That's another one of those things you can't put them together, can you? You can't have a program that was kept, that was spoken about since the world began and another program that was kept secret since the world began. Uh, there's no way those two go together. You can't put them together. And the only answer, just like with the Romans 14, with our week in the faith, the only answer uh, is what do we do with the works of the law? What do we do with what Moses said? What do we do with the earthly ministry of Christ? What do we do with what Peter and the 12 are doing in Jerusalem right now? And he says, you realize they're part of God's prophetic program with the nation of Israel. They're not a part of, Paul, of God's mystery program for the body of Christ revealed through Paul's uh, apostleship. There you have the basic, if you want to handle God's word right now, and I'm gonna say it again because most people I've talked to, they wanna argue and, and they don't really care what God's, they care about what their theological system says, their religious system, their favorite Bible teacher, they're this or they're that. And then that's fine, go, go, don't waste my time, go about your business. Uh, but I'm talking, I'm trying to address people who are interested in knowing what God's word actually says and what God wants them to get out of it. The very first thing we have to know to handle God's word rightly, correctly, is to understand that the gospel accounts and the ministry of Peter and the Twelve are, we do not go to, we go to them for a learning. We can see God faithfully working. He says he can, he's confirming the promises to the Father. If he's confirming the promises, he means he's going to be faithful to him. But we don't go there for our instruction manual for today. They belong to God's prophetic program with the nation of Israel. Now here, uh, this is where we're going to jump off and we'll close with after the first one here. This is where uh, it gets really important because now he's going to bring up something. Uh, and uh, if you uh, dispense, if you don't value, if you dispense with right division, with Paul's distinct apostleship, uh, with rightly dividing God's word, here's, he's going to present for these Romans a huge problem. Uh, and we're going to close. I don't remember if that slide is in this set or not. Uh, but a big problem, a humongous problem, an insurmountable problem. If you throw away right division, there's gonna, we're going to see when we get to the next end of these four ref. He's going to give us four Old Testament references. Uh, we're going to be have a big problem. So let's go. Having set it up that way, I know I see you're all on the edge of your seat now. Well, you'll have to come back next week to hear the ending, the part two. But let's go ahead and read the, the first. Uh, well, let's read through all four. He's going to give four Old Testament references. Verse. Uh, Oh, I guess I need to get back to Romans. Romans 15. I was still in Acts. Romans 15. Romans 15. Look at verse 9. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Uh, and so he's answering the question here. How did God's mercy go out to the Gentiles in his prophetic program for the nation of Israel? How did that happen? Once you answer that question, you have to receive right division. There's no other option. The other option is too horrible to think about. And that's what he's building up to here. Verse 9, and the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Well, how was that done in Israel's prophetic program? As it is written. So now he's going to tell how, the, how God's mercy went out to the Gentiles uh, in his prophetic program. For this cause I will confess thee among the Gentiles. The eye there is David, and of course David represents the nation of Israel, specifically the believing nation of Israel, specifically that believing remnant of Israel. Uh, and I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. So that's one, that's from Psalm 
uh, 18, verse 10, and again he saith, Rejoice, ye Gentiles, notice, with his people. That's Deuteronomy 32, uh, and verse 11, and again, Praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. There again we have Psalm 117, and then uh, verse 12, and again Isaiah say, There shall be a root out of Jesse. Jesse is whose father? David's father. So all pertains to Israel, uh, root out of Jesse, and that he shall rise and reign over the Gentiles. In him shall the Gentiles trust. So what he's setting up here, he's got four Old Testament scriptures, and he's going to progress his way through it so that when you get to that fourth example, if you understand what he's talking about, you're going to have to make a decision. And one of the options, he's, uh, I'm assuming everybody is going to find so horrifying that they'll understand, uh, as he says in verse 13, that the God of hope has provided an answer to the problem. And so let's begin working our way. Let's go to Psalm 18, and we'll have to close with this, and then we'll do the next three uh, references next week as we progress uh, through his argument here. Go to Psalm 18. Psalm 18, uh, and we're not just going to pull verses out of context. It's a long psalm, so we're obviously not going to do the whole psalm either. But at least try to, let's try to get a little context here. This is, and let's read the introduction over in Psalm 18. Psalm 18, the introduction before verse 1 there, or a part of verse 1. Uh, to the musician, this is Psalm 18, to the, or the, to the chief musician, psalm, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, so we know it's David. David's the king of Israel. He's a representative of Israel, especially believing Israel, uh, who spoke unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. So there we have uh, the psalmist's basic uh, contextual situation. Remember how these psalms work. Uh, he takes something from uh, some real historical event from David's history. Remember David, the king of Israel, and he started conquering uh, all the surrounding enemy nations and but what was happening inside the nation. Uh, he was being chased around by Saul and the, the lo those loyal to Saul. I'm not going to go through that whole history. Hopefully that jogs everybody's memory. And he's rejoicing in the day here when he's delivered from all his enemies. He's delivered from his Gentile enemies, the surrounding nations around Israel. I remember under King David, uh, he pushed the territory of Israel further than has ever had ever occurred up to that point. Was I think it's further than it ever reached uh, until you get to end time events anyway. And he pushes out and he conquers uh, and the, uh, God destroys his enemies and he pushes out the territory of Israel as farther than it's ever gone before. I don't think it's ever been that far uh, since. And not only are the external enemies, so you got Gentiles outside the land, and you have Saul and his loyalists inside the land, fellow Jews who are his enemies. And his point is here, he's been delivered from all his enemies, the Gentiles outside the land and the Jews within the land, Saul and his loyalists, uh, and he's been delivered from all that. And so now with that little bit of background, here's the thing Paul's getting at. How are the Gentiles blessed in Israel's prophetic program? That's the question we're answering in these four uh, excerpts from the Old Testament. So now you just, Paul, David, hey, we're in a psalm where David's celebrating God has destroyed all his enemies, outside, inside, Gentile, Jewish enemies, they're all gone. And let's pick it up at verse 40. Verse 40. Thou hast given me the necks of my enemy, that I might destroy them that hate me. He's going through, he's showing what the Lord did uh, for him. They cried and there was none to save them. Even unto the Lord, he answered them not. Then did I beat them, as small as the dust of the wind, I did cast them out 
uh, of the dirt of the streets. Uh, thou hast delivered me from the strivings of the people. So we have a couple groups here. You gotta keep these uh, terms kind of identified. You have the heathen or the nations, the Gentiles. Uh, those are the Gentiles outside the land of Israel. Those are those surrounding nations. He's talking about God having uh, been victorious over through him. Then you have the people. The people are the Jews in the land, the people of Israel uh, in the land. There's going to be a third group, and we'll get there in a minute. And thou hast made me head of the heathen. So those are the Gentiles outside the land. Uh, and, a, a, and a people uh, whom I have known shall serve me. As soon as they hear of me, they shall obey me. Uh, the strangers shall submit themselves unto me. So now we have a third group, the strangers. Uh, you have the heathen, those are the Gentiles outside the land. You have the people, those are the Jews in the land. And now you have the strangers. Well, who are they? They're the Gentiles living in the land. They're visitors, or they're, maybe they're living there. So not necessarily visitors, but foreigners. I guess we would maybe talk about them being foreigners. And they're in the land. He's going to subdue them all. He's going to subdue the people. He's going to subdue the strangers in the land. And he's going to subdue the he surrounding, at least, heathen nation, Gentile nations. So the point of this is I'm not going to go through every detail of every one of these, these psalms and uh, prophecies. Uh, the point of this is first God destroys the heathen and all of David Israel's enemies. Now what does he do with David slash Israel now? All the enemies have been destroyed. David's been redeemed. He's been delivered. He's been avenged. All the enemies are gone. All the ones left are the friendly ones, friendly Gentiles and friendly, his loyal Jews here, the believing Jews. And he says here, verse 46, the Lord liveth and blessed be my rock and let the Lord God my salvation be exalted. It is God that avengeth me and subdueth the people under me. He delivereth me out of the hands of the enemies. Yea, thou liftest. Now we, what's in the next thing that you're going to do? After God destroys all the enemies, he's going to save his friends, beginning with Israel, beginning with David, beginning with Israel. What does he do with them? Israel, uh, David says here, Avenge, uh, he delivereth me from my enemies, thou liftest me up above those that rise up against me, thou hast deliverest me from the violent man. David, Israel, gets saved, gets delivered, all, her all he saves his friends, destroys his enemies, and raises up David, Israel. He's going to raise up David, Israel. Of course, this is something that happened, we call this a minor application in David's day, but it's going to be a major application in that tribulation period when God restores the nation of Israel, that believing remnant represented by David here in this psalm, and he's going to plant them in the land and raise them up above the heathen destroying all the enemies beginning in the house of Israel and especially the Gentiles. And he's going to raise up that nation of Israel, that David. And what's David going to do when he's raised up? Uh, he says here, Therefore will I give thanks unto thee. This is our verse from Romans. O Lord, among the heathen, and sing praises unto thy name. Great deliverance giveth he to his king, and showeth mercy to his anointed to David, and to his seed forever. The seed of David. Uh, the, the believing remnant of Israel, uh, that is going to be delivered, redeemed, delivered, avenged first. He's going to raise that up. And then David goes out and sings God's praises to the heathen. The point Paul's making here, uh, for those who understand this passage and know it, uh, in which those people in Rome uh, with that strong Jewish background, see, they, this would be a psalm they'd know like that. They'd know this psalm inside and out. They're waiting for David to come and do, God and David to come and do what he's just talking about here doing. And the point Paul's making is when it comes to Israel's prophetic program that Christ's earthly ministry came to confirm and the ministry of Peter and the Twelve confirms, in that prophetic program, the Gentiles receive mercy from God with Israel and through her rise. 
the rising up of David. He's going to destroy all Israel's enemies and raise up Israel, may create of her the new nation, his own nation, reflecting his glory, the light of his glory. And they're going to go and they're going to sing praises to the Gentiles. Now keep that in mind. We'll hold the suspense there. We'll close with that for today. But he's going to give three more examples that say much the same thing, except the argument's going to progress. And when you get to the end, I'll just say it now, when you get to the end, uh, you're going to be stuck with a choice. Either we all are sitting here utterly, completely, entirely, hopelessly, hopelessly lost, or... God changed programs by raising up the Apostle Paul. And we'll leave it at that and come back next week for the exciting conclusion. Let's close with a word of prayer.